those are some big headlines from this past month. Now we have a big headline for next month. So with that, welcome to our speaker, Dr. Mark Panning. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, why don't, before you go, let me just ask you just a few bars about sure. your background. You have a PhD? Yeah, I have. A, so my PhD is in geophysics, seismology. I started all of my work originally on the Earth, um, but I, <laughs> <laughs> on the, well, obviously on the Earth, but also about the Earth. Um, and uh, um, did a, got distracted in a postdoc on looking at uh, other bodies, and now I think about Mars and and uh, and icy moons for the most part. Did you imagine you would do this when you were young? Or uh, were you thinking about the Earth only as a kid? I, I so I, I thought I was going to be uh, maybe a mathematician or maybe a chemist or something like that, and then the geologists were more fun. Oh. So. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I understand that. <laughs> we, we have said in this show that the yeah. geologists are the biggest drinkers. Yeah, they are. The astronomers are second, but geologists. Geologists, yeah, geologists, geologists can drink. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're and they're also really good at bad puns. I don't know if people could hear. There was an on the rocks joke over there. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, should I? Should I? Please do. Okay. Tell so, us about Insight. So um, uh, I, I'm I'm a co-investigator on Insight, which means I'm on the science team. Um, JPL is full of engineers for the most part. They're, they keep uh, our, a scientist around as um, I don't know as tokens. I, I, we're, <laughs> we're we're mascots maybe. Um, so uh, um, regardless, Insight launched on Cinco de Mayo. And uh, it, we're now just, I don't know, about 4 million miles away from Mars, something like that. Uh, and we're landing on the 26th. Um, so basically, what's different about InSight compared to most Mars missions you've probably heard about? Most Mars missions look at the surface. Um, the whole point about InSight is we're trying to look inside of Mars. So, um, and the reason why we're doing it, um, I always have to justify myself to people. So I, 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 I say the reason why we're looking in Mars is to understand how rocky planets form. And one of the four rocky planets that, uh, in the solar system, of course, is the one we're sitting on. So, um, so we're trying to understand how planets form in general. And so there's, this is just a picture of those four rocky planets plus the moon. Um, and uh, you, we got all these cartoons of what they look like on the inside. And you notice Mars is over there on, the, on your uh, right. Um, and there's not much detail in that cartoon. We're, really, we're out to put the detail in that and to understand how Mars formed and evolved. Um, so we have good data on the Earth and the Moon for the most part, and not so much about the other planets. So we know that. The Earth, um, when, I, when I say warm and very active, I'm talking about inside. It has a lot of heat inside that's getting out. And that's what drives the things we see on the surface of the Earth, things like plate tectonics, earthquakes, volcanoes. It's all being driven by heat in the inside getting out. We know the Earth is warm and very active. But right next to us, we have the moon, which is much smaller and lost its heat very early. And so it's cold and mostly quiet. It doesn't have a lot of quakes. We actually do have, uh, we did have seismic instruments on the moon. So we know that there are moon quakes, but they're very, sm they're very small and very few. Um, Mars is going to be somewhere in between. And, uh, and it's going to, by, uh, by observing it, we're going to learn a lot more about um, how active it is and how it evolved over the last four and a half billion years. Um, so there are two main sorts of goals we have uh, with Insight. So this slides the first set of goals. These are the ones about looking at the inside of of in, of, the, of Mars. We're not actually going to cut it in half, of course. Um, it would be really cool, though, but probably uh, we'd get in, we'd get in trouble with planetary protection. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so anyway. Yeah, so, so anyway, we're going to uh, look for the size of the core. This is actually a really open question. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, uh, we, what it's made out of, we know it's mostly iron and nickel like the Earth, but there's other things inside of it. And depending on how much it is, it changes the density and how big it is. We know 
the gravity of Mars, but we, that tells us a trade-off between how big the core is and how dense it is. But um, this is gonna get to the details. Um, we also are gonna look at the crust. If we know how thick the crust is, we know, we know more about how much Mars has melted in the past, because everything on the crust, the thin edge around a planet, is stuff that's melted in the past. Um, and we're gonna look at the other structure of the interior. And a real critical point is to look at how warm the interior is, because that's what drives the process. Mars is a little weird that it's had volcanoes. For example, Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the solar system. It's really big and it's been erupting in a basically the same place for billions of years. That's really strange. And uh, understanding why Mars is doing the things it does requires knowing what's happening inside of it. Um, I'm a seismologist, so one of the cool things I want to know about is how, how often Mars quakes happen. I've spent a lot of time over the past 10 years that we've been working on putting together Insight arguing that there will be Mars quakes that we can record. Um, I'm hopefully going to be proven right here very soon. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but, so the, but that is a primary delivery. You know, how powerful these, uh, these Mars quakes are. We know it's gonna be quieter than the Earth. We also are very certain it's gonna be more active than the moon. And so, uh, and so this is gonna nail down better th those details. Um, and the interesting thing is um, a lot of the, the quakes we saw on the moon were actually impacts. There, uh, you, um, actually, the biggest quakes observed on the moon were the impacts from the Saturn 4B stages. Um, so those, those are the biggest things recorded on the moon. Um, we should be recording in, uh, impacts on Mars as well. Well, the, there's an atmosphere on Mars, so it filters out a lot of the little guys, but we should still see impacts. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> we're impacting very gently. <laughs> Um, so here's a, a, a picture of the lander. For those who have followed Mars landers, the picture of this lander might look a lot to you like Phoenix looked like. Um, that's because it's really the same spacecraft as Phoenix. It's built in Lockheed Martin, same, everything's the same basic design. Our arm that we use to position instruments on the surface is the same arm that was, same basic arm that was on Phoenix. In fact, they left the scoop on it. Um, uh, um, I, I know um, in past editions of this, Matt Gollenbeck has come. He was very instrumental in making sure that scoop stayed there because he wants to do geology on Mars. Um, and I'm going to help him try to talk the engineers into letting us do that. But, um, but um, we, well, there are three main instruments associated with InSight. So there's the, the seismic instrument. That's the size instrument. It's the one kind of on the... the the left of the screen there that looks like it has an upside down pie plate on it. That's, a, that's the wind and thermal screen. On the, on the uh, right of your screen is the HP cubed instrument. That's actually a heat flow instrument that's gonna go down and, and I'll show a little more on that later. And then our, our last major experiment on it is the RISE experiment, which is actually just radio science. So it's using antennas that are on there for communication anyway. <clears throat> so HP cubed. I put out, we love our acronyms. Um, this one is heat flow and physical properties probe. And so we, instead of writing out three Ps, we call it HP cubed. Um, this is, uh, um, it's basically a self-driving nail. Um, it's, it's a little spring-loaded hammer and it's gonna go down up to five meters, 16 feet for those of us who deal in, in, in um, English units. Um, uh, um, hopefully the engineers are all using the right units. I won't go down that road. <laughs> um, so uh, so it's, that's pretty deep. Um, and the reason why we're going that deep is because it's trailing thermometers behind it. And it's going to measure how much the temperature gradient going out, which tells us how much heat's going out. And we have to go pretty deep because there's a daily variation. That only goes down a few centimeters. But there's also a yearly variation that goes down a meter or so. And we want to get well below that so we're really recording the heat flow coming out of the interior. This is a cutaway view. That's actually showing all of the, the cabling inside it before it comes out. It does kind of look like Legos, though. The, the only version I usually see is one that's a 3D printed version. Um, and so I'm used to think, seeing it as kind of ridged plastic, but it, it doesn't look like that. It looks pretty good. Um, well, what happens if you hit rock? So it's, yeah, so that's a good question. So it's, it's designed so that if it hits a rock at an angle, it'll just cruise around it. Okay. If it hits a rock dead on, we're Stuck. We're kind of stuck. That's we're, we, so, so once again, I'm, I'm going to reference Matt Gollenbeck a lot. He assures us 
that the site we're landing is going to be very low on rocks. Um, and so hopefully he's, uh, uh, hopefully he's as, as right as he is confident. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best line I've ever heard. Yeah, so, um, so we don't need to get down to five meters to get good data. We, we're, we're pretty confident that two to three meters we're going to get good data. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that there shouldn't be too many rocks close to the surface. But we're gonna, the seismometer is going to be out there anyway. That's what I'm most excited about because I'm a seismologist. <laughs> but but um, there, there's, the chances for success, are, we're assured, are, are, are quite high. But we'll see what Mars... We only get one shot. We can't pull it out. Yeah, so once it goes in, the ground collapses behind it. So if we tried to pull it out, we'd just break the tether. Uh, the radio experiment, I'm not going to talk about this one too much, but this is um, the picture on the left is showing those little green cones coming out. Those are, are the, the path of the radio waves. that You can't see the radio waves normally, obviously. Um, but they're coming out of these little UHF antennas on the side. And those are communicating direct to the deep space network. Um, one of that's, I think that's probably a picture from Goldstone out in the Mojave Desert where we do all of our communication. And they're going to do very careful Doppler ranging on there. And we'll locate our site on InSight to two centimeters accuracy. Um, and, uh, but, the, but we're even better on velocities. And that's going to tell us how the, the axis of rotation is changing. And there's this thing called nutations, how it, it wobbles back and forth. It's like when you shake a milk jug. Um, you can tell how much liquid's in it by how it shakes. That little wobble of the, the rotation is going to tell us about Mars core. That was a brilliant explanation of a complex thing. Yeah, it's <laughs> a little oversimplified, but it gets you down the right road anyway. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the seismometer. Um, so this, we're actually having two seismometers inside that, that pretty sphere there is the very broadband instrument. It's super sensitive to a broad frequency band. So it, it's sensitive enough that it can see motions that are on the scale of a hydrogen atom. So this is a really, really sensitive instrument. Uh, strapped to the outsider, the short period instrument, which is a little less sensitive, but the short period's a bit of a misnomer. It's actually a pretty good seismometer. It's a lot better than a geophone, um, even the short period one. Um, so is it an interferometer then? Uh, no, so they're, they're both well, so they're both basically mass on spring sort of things with a feedback system. And that's how you get the broadband re response. There's not actually an interferometer there. Um, it's, it's, it's measuring the feedback. Um, so uh, where was I? Ah, so yeah, it's really sensitive. I, I guess yeah. that's. Um, <laughs> Because it's so sensitive, it's also sense it's really good at measuring everything. So it measures magnetic field changes, air pressure changes, wind. So we also have the best weather station ever landed on Mars. So we can correct for that. Um, so that's the other good thing we're doing. Um, I, I, um, this is oh, got too many words on it. But so, but why planetary seismology? I, I you know, the PowerPoint is an art. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and sometimes I'm not an artist. Um, but this is an, an old picture of a paper saying what the inside of Mars looks like. And I always like to point out that for Mars, this is a cartoon. When we put this up for the Earth, I can tell you that the radius of the core of the Earth is 2,891 kilometers. And I can be that precise because of seismology, because we know exactly how long it takes a seismic wave to go down there and bounce back. We don't have that on Mars. We know how heavy Mars is, and we know how hard it is to spin it. Um, and so with those two things combined, we can say it has a core, and it could be anywhere uh, from about 1,300 to about 2,000 kilometers. I mean, those are extreme end members, but it's certainly hundreds of kilometers of uncertainty. Um, and that has big impacts for what the core is made out of and what the planet is doing. So we want to go there. Uh, that's the, the example for the core. This, we can, I can talk about the same things for the crust. This is trying to figure out those details. Um, I've got two slides on the history of planetary seismology, because this is an, a, a, an interesting thing. And I, I like to call these the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the good is Apollo missions. 
They, uh, um, five of the Apollo missions put really good seismometers, and one of them put a bunch of geophones re <laughs> referencing that. And they actually just found most of that data in the last few years. It got lost, and it was, it was rediscovered. It's kind of cool. Um, but um, the data was recorded until 1977. It was turned off two months after I was born. So I'm a planetary seismologist that's lived in the era of no planetary seismology for the most part. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, you know, also very coincident with Star Wars. I don't know if there's significance of that too. Um, <laughs> there are two other missions that had data. Um, the two of the Soviet Venus landers had geophones on them that were recorded for a total of about ten minutes. Um, Venus is a terrible place to be. Um, and the Philae lander also had geophones on it, but Philae had issues, which we could talk about. Um, uh, the data looks weird. These are pictures of seismograms. The one on the top is an Earth seismogram for an hour. The one on the bottom is a lunar seismogram for an hour. Mm. They don't look the same. You guys are not seismologists out there, but I think you can tell those don't look the same. <laughs> um, Earth has these big impulsive arrivals. The moon, everything bounces around. Mars is going to be somewhere in between. We're hopeful it's closer to Earth than the moon. Why um, are you hopeful? But that's the case. Well, so the, I, I can go into details. The moon is, is, is very broken up. Mars is going to be a little less broken up. And the bigger difference is one reason why the moon looks so scattered is because it's very, very dry. And um, it means that seismic waves propagate really well. And then they hit all these fractures and bounce around. On Mars, because there is water present, even if it's not liquid, um, it's going to increase the seismic continuation, which damps out a lot of those reverberations, basically. Because to hope for something as a scientist is an interesting concept. Usually, you just want to know what, what it is. But is that because you want there it, to be? It makes it easier to interpret the data oh. if we're not seeing all of this bouncing around stuff. Okay. I, I, I'm saying, as a seismologist who wants to interpret all the deep structure that I hope it looks a little more easy to interpret than the moon. It's, we can do, we actually have good models of the lunar interior from that problematic data, but, <laughs> but it's, um, it, I, I'm hoping we'll have a little easier time with Mars data. Got it. Is it the analogy that the moon, uh, when, some, when, it, when it is struck by a meteor or you know, launch stage of some sort, that the moon essentially rings? Yeah, so well, actually all planets do that. So um, you know, every you know, the, the, this is actually how I got my start on Earth seismology is looking at these things called the normal modes, and this is how the moon rings like a bell. So the the lowest frequency on on Earth is, I think, it's in fifty something minutes. So when whenever an earthquake happens, the Earth vibrates, and the lowest frequency is that. It's a, it, and that happens on the moon. That happens on Mars. They all do um, what what the moon is like. This is more like energy. Diffusion instead of um, it's, it's like yeah. fog. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's 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 the it's bouncing off of all of these things and coming from all sorts of directions at the same time. Is it a density issue? I mean, is that is is there a different density for to moon that? It's it's more it's it's fractures. It's it's very fractured down kilometers deep because okay. it's just been gardened by impacts for billions of years. Now, I know there are probably a lot of people with questions, so I want to make sure we leave time at the end so yeah, uh, I, I, I get distracted. Yeah, yeah, let's we'll go, go forward. And uh, uh, so we have time for all the everyone's questions. Bad and the ugly, I would say. <laughs> Viking had seismometers. One didn't work. One did work, but it's in that little red circle down there sitting on top of it. And um, one of its legs was on a rock. And so it just it's like sitting at a dinner table when one of the legs isn't the right length. It just uh. rocked back and forth. So we, could, we didn't see much. Um, the ugly, I would say, is that there are at least 10 other missions that were included, si included seismometers that never got to where they were supposed to be. So that's been our bad luck. Insight's going to hopefully move us to the good luck side. Um, one of the interesting things about the Earth versus Mars is everything on the Earth we do in seismology is networks. You probably took a class at some point where you locate, where they talked about locating events, and they said you need three stations to locate an event. And it's like that picture on the left where you draw the circles and where they intersect. That's the epicenter. That's a lie. You can do it with one station. <laughs> Spent a lot of time convincing people of this. Um, uh, we nowadays we actually use very dense networks, and we look at waves that move across it, and we can actually say which direction all of those waves come from. And so that would be great if we could do that on Mars. But it's really expensive to land one seismometer. Um, and so we're, we're, just, uh, we're 
working on how we can use these single station techniques. And once again, this is too many words, too many words. I would like to put one set of equations because I am a nerd. I am a nerd and so I have to have one set of equations and this is really just three equations. Um, I'm not gonna explain them honestly. But the point is, the point is we can look at things like uh, the, there, there are waves that go around a planet called surface waves. They are stuck to the surface of the sphere of the planet. And Mars is smaller than Earth which means that we have a better chance of seeing waves that go around the planet more than once. Um, and I'm gonna show a video of that modeled, not in reality, um, uh, in, in the next slide. But the, the point is, if we look at the timing of these waves that go around more than once, we can figure out exactly where the earthquake is. Mars quake, oh. sorry, wrong word. Um, yeah, so it's basically the timing of the three events. It's three equations, three unknowns, and my daughters are taking algebra right now so they can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to maybe give that a problem for them when we get home. Um, they hate oh, Dad. Me. They hate me. <laughs> um, and so that gives you a distance. And if you, uh, if you can look at how the waves come in, there's a polarity. It tells you which direction it came from. So that tells you where it was. Um, and the figure on the right is just my, the, there's a group in Zurich who have put this all into a nice uh, GUI and they can just do this on the fly when we get the data. I've, I, I've been sending them fake data and they've been practicing. Um, so hopefully the real data is uh, as good as my fake data. Um, we'll see very soon. Um, so my colleagues at Zurich also made this video here. So the, the glowing waves are actually those surface waves going around the planet. And so they go past the station, that first big bump in the wiggle on the left is what that first orbit, we call it R1. And then they're going around the planet. You're not gonna see R2 get there. It's gonna be while InSight's still on the backside of the planet, but you'll see a wiggle come in in the top left there uh, here pretty soon. Very soon. <laughs> there, that's R2. That's the, the one that came the long way around the planet. And then finally, everything's coming back together on the other side of the planet from where the Mars quake is. And then it's going to go past, and it's going to go past InSight again. And that's that third orbit. And once we've got those three, we can do locations. We can actually do locations for closer events, too. This is just, I think, an interesting way of, of showing how it works. So. I, you guys can read those, but uh, <laughs> we can. Um, so, the 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 I, I'm I'm happy to answer questions. I guess I, I definitely yeah. have a couple of questions, but let's take some from the audience first, uh, just so that we're sure there's time. Yes, in the very back. So, on the uh, rare luck that you might catch the uh, at a, a impactor hitting uh, Mars as versus an earthquake, would you gain any additional information? Yeah. So a Mars earthquake versus a impactor. Yeah, so we're, we're um, you know, we've worked at the probability, we're expecting to see a couple impacts during the, the two-year nominal mission. Um, and we definitely do gain something because we, ha we, ha we already have agreements working with, uh, with the high-rise camera so that, that if we locate something that we think is an impact, they're gonna take pictures of the area and then we'll know exactly where it happened. So one of the problems we have in seismology is we, we want to know about the source and we want to know about the structure in between. Everything we're trying to figure out is looking at waves that go between the source and, and our location. Um, and if we don't know exactly where the source is, then there's this trade-off between what the structure is and what the source is. And if we have a picture of the source, we know exactly where it is. And so that really eliminates a lot of the uncertainty in our understanding of what's happening inside. I'm going to ask in the dark, shady part. It's hard to see you guys, but I want to make sure I don't miss anyone up there if you have a hand up. OK. Yes. Um, more question about the moon being fractured. That's, that's uh, I guess you said a few kilometers deep. But yeah. how, how deep do they go? That's really interesting. And Sometimes they call it a mega regolith on the, on the moon, although that's become less popular these days. But it's fu still fun to say because it's a little rhymy. Um, uh, um, but yeah, so the, 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 the very surface is just totally broken up. So the first few meters are just totally broken up. But those fractures still extend pretty deep. The moon is really cold. Um, and so it's cold and brittle down to fairly deep. So um, yeah, it, those fra the fractures go pretty deep on, on the moon. Yes, in the back. As long as you're probing, are you going to look for organic material as well? 
Um, there's nothing on there to measure that, so uh, uh, so we you, you know so we, we wouldn't have any way of of, of making that measurement. Um, I, I, I um, you know I I always it's it's interesting to me because I always just dodge biology classes as much as I could. I so uh, <laughs> life's too confusing. I can deal with physics, biology. I don't. It's too complicated for me. So. Did yes. How long is it going to last on the, what is the uh, extent of the mission? I know she had solar panels on there to consider a uh, nuclear source for fuel. Well, well that last thing, will it help us understand the magnetic field loss of Mars? Yeah, so we do have a magnetometer on on the um, on the craft, and we're going to be monitoring it. And it's actually a, a good way of adding to our magnetic knowledge compared to the orbital observations. As far as the duration of the mission, our primary mission goes one full Martian year. So we are near the equator so that we can be on year round. Um, that was, a, that was a, the, a big deciding factor in where we landed. Um, and they've modeled how much dust will accumulate on the solar panels over time and added up all the worst case scenarios. And we should be able to last a year even adding up all the worst case scenarios and not having any dust cleaning events. We expect there will be dust cleaning events. So, um, you know, I'm very optimistic that we'll still be running with a pretty good power at the end of that full Martian year, at which point NASA will decide whether we keep going or not. That will be up to NASA, but you know what my opinion will be. <laughs> uh, yes. How will what InSight finds out affect our plans to one day live on Mars? That's, that's an interesting question, uh, and it's maybe not the most direct way. I mean, certainly understanding the heat flow could affect some plans for how we do energy, for example, in a, in a settlement. If you know what, how the temperature varies with depth, then you can know, I, I, I guess you'd still call it geothermal on, on, on Mars, uh, maybe aerothermal. Aerothermal, I was yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you've probably changed the terminology there. So that would be one possible impact. Um, I, I view it more as just understanding how planet, planets formed and evolved, and that's, that's enough to justify it for me. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of direct impact on, on that sort of thing, I'm not exactly sure beyond better understanding how the, the heat flows as a function of depth, which affects one possible power supply, I guess. I'd like to follow up on that idea of um, how planets formed, because you see that on their website, and then, yeah. you know, oh, we'll learn how it formed. So can you just kind of give us the linkage between the data that you'll be getting and the thermal instrument we'll be getting and, and the wobbly one, the radio one, um, and how that tells us what it will tell us. Will it discriminate between different models? Are there different ideas that, oh, if, if the slope is this, it's the well, if the slope is that, it's that? So um, one of the, the bigger, biggest things we'll constrain is the chemistry of the core and mantle. Um, so, um, on Earth, we have a core that's mostly iron and nickel and 10% something else. We actually don't know what it is on Earth, so. Um, Unobtainium. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's something lighter. Um, people have their different pet theories. Um, we think likely Mars has more other stuff put in because there's some evidence from tides that it's still liquid, which implies that there's probably a lot of other stuff put in there, but by narrowing down how dense the core is, we know how much light stuff's been put into it. Um, and we also can look at what the chemistry of the mantle is, which tells us how much iron is in the mantle. And so this is telling us how Mars differentiated, or rather did not differentiate, mm -hmm. as well as, as the Earth has apparently differentiated. Um, so that's telling us about the formation. Um, and by looking at the heat flow and by looking at the seismic velocities in the mantle, that's gonna tell us the temperature going down to the mantle, which tells us how much heat Mars is held onto, which also lets us know, which also helps us constrain how much radioactive decay is going on inside Mars. Um, so we know, we know roughly how much radioactive decay is going on in Earth, and we know roughly what the chemistry of meteorites are, which we think are the building blocks of the rocky planets. But until we actually get data from Mars, we don't know if our, our guesses on what the building blocks of Mars are, are really correct. So by constraining that chemistry and the temperature, it's really valid, hopefully validating our models or possibly telling us our models were totally wrong. Um, so, it, it, so yeah, that's really the, the main things we're looking at there. And are the models wildly different? Yeah, so 
so <laughs> this is this is interesting. So um, I, to me, because I, uh, the if you look at our what we call our a priori models of Mars structures, the old models covered a really broad range, and then the there's the 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 everybody's narrowed into a fairly narrow range yeah. of what the models should look like now. And I'm I'm very convinced that we're going to get there, and it's going to be different than all of those nice narrow range of models we have. So it's it's. Planetary, I, this is a, a, a overarching theme in planetary science, is that the less data we have, the more confident we are. Yes. <laughs> um, like so, the rocks and the landing field. Yeah, so, so when we're confronted with the reality, I, I think we're going to have to rethink how confident we are in the range of models that were really, you know, it match what we think is going on in Mars. I know that there are more questions, um, but I, I'm afraid we have to uh, draw to a close now. And at break, perhaps you'll talk to some folks individually. Sure. I know that people will want to come up to you and ask you some questions. So um, with that, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Panning for that superior talk.